Good morning, all. I'm Dr. Gina Palmer, College of Leadership and Ethics. Welcome to Gender Perspectives in Strategic Plans and Military Operations. I'm pleased to introduce our next moderator, Dr. Tom Creeley, Associate Professor at the College of Leadership and Ethics at the Naval War College. Please help me welcome Dr. Creeley. Thank you, Tom. Good morning and welcome to our session on Gender Perspectives and Strategic Plans in Military Operations. Today we have with us Ms. Carrie Compton, who's Gender Advisor to U.S. Naval Forces, Africa, and Sixth Fleet. She is also a Marine officer. We also have Lieutenant Commander Brianna Strand, U.S. Navy and University of Texas, Austin, as a um, federal executive um, in that program there. Uh, please um, silence your phones. There will be um, Jackie and Maeve who will be here to bring a um, microphone to you if you have questions during our uh, Q&A session. And our presentation is between 15 and 20 minutes and uh, Ms. Compton will go first. But first I wanna talk about something with operations and national security. Nine years ago, I created the Ethics and Emerging Military Technology Graduate Certificate Program. And from the very beginning, women have been an integral part of our research. The research for this program informs national security policy for the Center for Digital and Artificial Intelligence, um, DARPA, Special Competitive Studies Project, Five Eyes, NATO, and other groups as well. So I wanted to point out the a couple of works here. Well, I have a current student who's here in the program. She may be in the audience, Lieutenant Commander Spencer, uh, Sterling Spencer, uh, Navy JAG Corps, and she's writing on space and ethics. The title of her paper is The Threshold Problems, Legal, Ethical, and Moral Considerations of Use of Force in Outer Space and Shaping Peacetime Norms. We've had Foreign Service Officer Warren Palazza wrote about truth, reality, lost in translation, Russia, and the ethical implications of emerging technologies in the information environment. And her article has recently been published in the Northern Plains Ethics Journal. And then certainly on Christmas Eve, I received an email from a former student uh, Michelle Wolf, who is an Army civilian scientist, and she wrote and had published Releasing Athena, which is an electrifying techno thriller. Not, uh, Nightlock is a mysterious code that holds the key to untold power. Releasing Athena is not just a novel, it is an experience. And she spends her days thinking big thoughts and solving big problems. And Michelle spends her time writing and thinking about not only what could go wrong with emerging technology, but also what could go right. Someone asked the question a little bit earlier. What is smart power? What does that really mean? This is the intellectual capital of young men and women and people who have the ability to think through the hard and difficult problems because this is mind-bending work that is needed for our national security and it includes everyone to think about where we are and what is the future and how to respond to our adversaries in the future. So at this point in time, we will begin with Ms. Compton. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I am a Marine Corps officer. I'm a uh, naval aviator. But considering that I've been a gender advisor for the Navy for the past two years, you can trust what I'm saying because I'm more blue now. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about gender considerations with uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh, as well as the rise in force of labor at sea due to IUF. And just for uh, my sake, I'm going to refer to it as IUF from now on. 
Uh, so naval commands within and around the AFRICOM and Indo-PACOM area of responsibility have been significantly focusing their efforts on countering IUUF, uh, and for a very good reason. Uh, today we'll be talking about the rise in awareness of IUUF and how it has and is detrimentally impacting marine security. Uh, with the effects that are felt well beyond the country's economic exclusion zone, or EEZ, and why it is imperative that a gender perspective is considered with countering these maritime threats. In that same vein, there is also a rise in forced labor at sea and how that directly ties to IUUF activities. Uh, before we delve in uh, to the gender considerations of IUUF and the forced labor at sea and why it's important to maritime security forces, we need to understand the history behind the increase in the global demand for stocks and fisheries and how the endangered, uh, the engendered and increases in IUF activities worldwide. The impacts, which are long lasting and potentially could be uh, cataclysmic, um, those are what we're going to be talking about. All right. So in 2023 is the most recent IUF index report, which ranks countries on a scale from one to five, five being the worst, and is represented by the darker hue. As you can see, China is in the darkest hue on the map and is ranked number one out of 152 countries with an index score of 4.3 and climbing. For comparison, the, uh, the United States, which also has a darker hue, is 1.89 and is ranked 28 out of 152 countries with an index score. Yeah. India and Russia also rank six and seven out of 152 countries respectively and have scores of 2.95 and 2.78. So you can see how China is uh, significantly more, um, their, their, their score is much worse. Most countries' IUF scores continue to increase as demand for fish steadily rises with no reprieve and the ability to effectively counter it, especially as IUF is lucrative, it's a lucrative business, accounting for almost $9 to $17 billion annually as of 2023. The United Nations report that overall IUF fishing accounts for up to 30% of total catches, and in some important fisheries like tuna and other high-value whitefish, um, those catches or particular species could be up to three times the permitted amount. Almost 30% of the world's fisheries are overexploited and over 60% are already fully exploited, immediately causing economic and environmental uh, threats and issues. The largest importer of fish are the EU, uh, followed closely by the United States and China. But why is that? <clears throat> Over the last couple of decades, uh, which data has been collected, the consumption of animal-based proteins across the world has substantially increased. This can be accounted for due to the increased populations, rising affluence, urbanization, and changing eating habits. When the cost of raising, raising land-based animal proteins starts to become unsustainable due to the rising costs and available plant-based proteins required to sustain those animals, the demands for the most cost-effective are the fish-based proteins, and that demand will increase. Another factor that exasperates those numbers is the ability to go further out to sea for longer periods of time and to haul even larger catches. The above graph shows the changes in seafood um, and fish consumption every 30 years from 1961 to 2021. It was not until the early 1990s that aquaculture and fish farming started to increase with the rising seafood consumption. In 2020, around 49% of the world's supply of fish, crustaceans, and mollusks was farmed rather than caught, which is an increase from 13% in the from 1990. However, fish farming requires fish meal which is pulverized small fish in order to sustain those fish farms, which in turn increases demand and also limits the food supply for larger fishes out in the ocean. We can see how this could potentially turn out. The fish meal and fish oil market size is projected to double from 7.4 billion in 2023 to 13 billion by 2033. Overall, the surging global demand for fish has been at odds with efforts to avoid overfishing and preserve marine wildlife. So the cost of IUF practices uh, felt, are felt all over the world, uh, but I'm gonna focus on one region that is of particular interest uh, for the US Naval Forces Africa and how IUF has affected such a large area so detrimentally. 
In many, if not all, coastal communities within the Gulf of Guinea, fish procurement is a means for jobs and sustenance. Most people along the Gulf of Guinea have relied heavily on the procurement of fish, and because most people within this region live well below the international poverty line, fish have been one of the few dependable livelihoods for many generations. When you add IUF, um, when you add IUF uh, caused by distant water fishing activities and the inability to control overfishing, many of those artisanal fisheries are now required to venture further outside of the normal territorial and contingent zones. Uh, in vessels or boats that are not made for the high seas. Local fishers have lost revenue due to the drop in accessible catch and have been forced to go farther out to sea, significantly increasing their safety risk and leading to higher levels of mortality. According to a 2022 uh, Fish Safety Foundation study, more than 100,000 people die annually while engaged in legal, commercial, and IUF fishing. Now, while fishing is inherently uh, a risky activity, IUF and overfishing exasperate and contribute to those deaths. But it comes down to necessity or to human security. For context, in Cote d'Ivoire, the coastal catch fell nearly 40 percent between 20, uh, 2003 and 2020. In Ghana, the catch of smaller fish dropped 59 percent in the last 26 years. It is believed that Nigeria is at almost similar situation with similar trends affecting local artisanal fisheries, um, which support the livelihoods of 24 million people or about 10% of the population of Nigeria. Projections in these three countries suggest catches will continue to plunge by another 50% by 2050. In smaller countries with limited marine uh, security capabilities like Sierra Leone and Gambia, IUF activities, especially for the smaller fish to make fish meal, have decreased weekly hauls from over 100 kilograms down to four kilograms. To exasperate the situation, trawlers also violate size restrictions and take juvenile fish that haven't yet had a chance to reproduce, accelerating the fish stock decline. The depletion of fish stocks and the potential for a fishery collapse caused by IUF are significant, but the causes for the potential collapse are manifold and include rising ocean temperatures, as well as overfishing by the artisanal fisheries who are just trying to maintain their livelihood. So why is it important for maritime security forces to consider gender? IUF has detrimentally affected the local, regional, and international economy, local and regional food security, employment, and the marine environment, and has links to transnational organized crime. When distant water fishing and illegal fishing take away a person's livelihood, that person or family needs to find substitutes to make ends meet. If there's limited to no opportunities to make up for the lost wages and the sustenance, this becomes a crisis. People are forced to either venture further out to sea and risk their lives, join these fleets of trawlers and potentially be subject to forced labor or harmful labor practices, or join organized crime syndicates to make up for those lost wages. Why do we need to take this into consideration or why do we need to consider gender? Most, if not all, artisanal fishery, fishermen in and around the Gulf of Guinea, as well as around the world, are males. The thing is, IUF activities affects genders, all genders, men, women, boys, and girls, both on the sea and on the land. The maritime secure insecurity displayed in many of these coastal countries has shown no respect for borders or gender. One feature within the Gulf of Guinea maritime space uh, that has received limited scholarly analysis and empirical assessment has been this disaggregated gendered impact of this insecurity within these coastal communities. Although men make up the vast majority of seafarers, women are present at all stages of the marine and artisanal fisheries value chain, from the pre-financing and the preparation of fishing outings to the reception, processing, and marketing of the fish. Protein intake in sub-Saharan and poor coastal communities accounts for 22 to 50% of their protein intake. And so women are a crucial contribution in the fisheries and are essential in ensuring food security and enhancing community stability. These communities are a space for men and women to earn an income, foster social cohesion, and generate tax revenues for national economies. 
when IUF takes away that source of income and sustenance, it not only is a maritime security threat, but a gendered threat. When men and young boys are forced to work in distant water trawlers, which makes a majority of the IUF activities, they are now taking away women's contribution to the economy. Uh, they're taking it away from the economy. Not only that, but aboard these trawlers can entail inhumane practices as those foreign flag vessels are rarely, if ever, subjected to the laws within the EEZ. When there is a lack of maritime security capabilities and enforceable laws, in a community that is reeling economic, economically and desperate for food, these foreign vessels have basically a carte blanche over the lives who, uh, of those who are seeking work. These men and these boys um, are subjected to long hours, no pay, bad working conditions, with no medical assistance, and an overall sense of indifference to human life, and suffering by the hands of these local and foreign flag uh, vessels when they are unable to provide for the families on shore that rely on this seafarer, now the women and children are detrimentally affected. So for example, um, in the Indian Ocean off of Madagascar, illegal fishing may represent as much as half the total catch due to IU activity from the industrial and artisanal sectors. However, uh, they do not have, the, the country does not actually have the capability of uh, assessing those catches because they do not go to those same ports. So how do we try and counter maritime security threats? There have been proposals by the EU and the UN on how to counter IUF activities and cover legal, institutional, economic, and social dimensions uh, and require the involvement of national, regional, and international fishing authorities. And although there are many and already many national and international laws and regulations in place designed to combat IUF, in many cases, um, the cases are practically, it's a practical implication, our implementation is still lacking. And even if it was implemented, the effect is largely unknown. Even where the political will does exist, it is still a long way to go in rendering that will to concrete action. And this includes having the funding, manning, and vessels to properly surveil, and whether the local authorities are even able to effectively enforce that. Is the government, and we have to also ask the question, is the government prone to outside investors and look the other way? Unfortunately, there's no easy way to counter IUF and forced labor. And because the demand for fish will continue to trend upwards and still be lucrative, the choices are minimal and require uh, adaptation and changes in cultural and societal norms. A region that is in an economic decline needs it to diversify in order to weather a crisis. In and around the Gulf of Guinea, higher education historically has not uh, had the same significance as it does in other countries, and especially when it comes to those who are in the maritime sector. So, for example, the possibility for a transition in smaller communities within the Gulf of Guinea uh, will be challenging, especially pushing for more education, and not just because that requires more government funding. Traditionally speaking, staying in school is actually not really a thing uh, when the needs of the community and family outweigh the need for education. Young boys usually stay home to help mend the nets while young girls help their mothers smoke and market the fish. Taking school-age children out of support in the family for school is a huge opportunity cost. And because IUF has such a huge economic implication for coastal regions, which affects all genders, the best way to decrease IUF activities is to hit them where it hurts the most, their wallet. Actions which increase the level of penalty and the cost of IUF uh, operators could have the highest potential net payoff. Countries and regions must work together to be the most effective and can do this by eliminating tax havens, restricting uh, accessibility to goods and services for those IUF uh, operators, such as fuel, landing fees, insurance, communication, and navigation services. Apply extraterritorial domestic uh, sanctions to citizens engaged in IUF operations, uh, such as make flag states legally liable for lack of appropriate insurance, increase the penalties and sanctions, such as prison confiscation of vessels and catch, Harmonize flag, uh, flag state fine levels, identify beneficial ownership uh, vessels, and ban imports. 
To combat forced labor at sea, countries must work together in order to ratify and implement human rights conventions uh, relating to crews on fishing vessels, as well as improve economic and social situations in countries and regions supplying those cheap crews. So how can the maritime security operators be successful? They must use cooperative governance initiatives and guidance programs in order to enforce higher penalties, more uh, efficient monitoring, control and surveillance measures, and increase use of catch and trade documentation schemes. However, in order to have longer lasting effects, a cooperative approach across countries is needed, and it's very complex. In the case of unreported fishing, the better use of already existing systems to trace the origins of the catches and more generalized use of onboard observers could be helpful. Private legal operators have a strong incentive to ensure that their markets are not undermined by IUF and should be co-opted into taking a more active role in combating, combating IUF activities. More effort could be made to convince legal fishers to set up their own name and shaming of IUF activities that affect their operations uh, with a view to put more moral pressure on illegal fishing operators and change the culture of the industry. Countries need to cooperate to include all interested parties and establish management arrangements in areas that, uh, of the high seas that are unregulated. While more regulation, including monitoring, control, and surveillance may be a central part in the overall combat of IUF activities, they may be uh, costly to implement. So public authorities need to weigh their costs against the potential benefits and when doing so must con consider a gender perspective. And that is all. <laughs> Hi everybody, good morning. Um, glad they put us in the ice box, so I'm gonna try to keep you guys awake, uh, but I think the temperature in here might be doing that for me. Um, so I'm uh, at UT Austin, I'm a federal executive fellow down there. Uh, don't be jealous, I know the War College is great. Uh, but we have a great time down there. And I think being at a civilian university has been awesome for me to see different perspectives on national security and strategy uh, in a way that I haven't been able to get in some of my previous more naval focused education. So uh, a couple of things I get to do down there is is think a lot, uh, have a lot of time to do that. And one of the things that has been an interesting sort of pet project for me on that is thinking about how myself as a female in the military and how that con contributes to the kind of current climate that we found ourselves in. Um, this project for me kind of started after my last command, uh, my last aviation command. I was in a squadron of, the only female in a squadron of 45 male flight instructors. And I think the disparity of that really shocked me after, when I was a student in the VTs initially going through, I only had one female flight instructor. And so I thought when I'd go into my department head tour that that would have been different. Um, in the span of a decade. And I think I was just really shocked that it, it actually wasn't. Uh, so one of the things that this research has, has brought, brought out for me is the difference we talked about a little bit earlier this morning between assimilating and inclusion and what that really means in a workforce and in a military environment. So the, what I'm gonna talk today about is diversity as a national security imperative. And uh, I'll start kind of just with the research focus, so. I have my slides here too, just because uh, don't tell my flight doc, I, I cannot actually read what is going on on the back screen here. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's true though. Um, I sought to understand wh what are the true impacts of diversity on the military? I, th I think we've all kind of been a little rattled by some of the recent politicization of diversity and DEI specifically. And I think for me, my lived experience was that it just wasn't fitting with what I was hearing on the news. Um, and I'm sure many of you have had the same experience. I found that the efforts to make our workforce more inclusive and diverse had only been a positive thing for me. And when I heard the criticism of this from different perspectives, especially from our civilian leadership, it just didn't match the reality that I found I lived in. So I think I tried to understand how can I convince people that diversity is actually a really great thing in the military and it's really helped make our force better. And so this was how I, I started researching and looking into this. 
So the first thing I kind of looked at is I went back and I looked at, well, where did diversity start? And where did this process of inclusion start? And I would say for me, it really, World War II is when we saw the major, the most major impact of diversity and inclusion. Uh, we had over 350,000 women serve during World War II and over a million black uh, men and women serve. And so that was the first time we really saw a massive uh, influx of gender and racial inclusion. So that was a, a great start for me to learn a little bit more about this. And then I picked kind of three areas. I'm only going to talk about one of them today, just for your time's sake. Um, but I looked at female Apache pilots during the Iraq war from 03 to 2013, the female engagement teams that uh, worked in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then women and subs and that integration effort. And then I tried to look at both an empirical and an anecdotal evidence perspective, all with the attempt of trying to understand what was the real impact to diversity on our national security? Was it effective or was it not? And with these three particular case studies, I found unequivocally that it was positive. So if I, uh, just to kind of keep our Navy jargon going here, um, the bluff, the, what I want you to take away from this, if nothing else, are kind of four main points. First, um, War has changed, and I think in our current context of great power competition and really complex battle spaces, I think we have to be deliberate in demanding we have diverse teams to ensure our war fighting effectiveness. I don't think that anyone can say in our modern context that having a diversity of thought, opinion, problem solving is not in truly beneficial, especially when we have the kind of complex battle spaces that we now do. The second thing is <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into it too much, but I, I think the evidence is so overwhelming that we can all agree that diverse teams do just perform better. They elevate competition and they increase the talent pool. Uh, looking across industry, you'll see the same thing. There's big pushes in the industry to diversify as well because this same finding continues to bear out time and time again. The next takeaway I hope you get is women's integration in submarines specifically was first initiated due to a manpower shortage. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the conclusion I want you to draw is that it's resulted in raising the performance of the whole community. And that's why I think that women in sub specifically is a great example of why women in power or in positions in the military really enhances our national security. And then lastly, diversity really needs to be intentional needs to be directed and it needs to be policy driven. I think it is a national security imperative for us to have the most capable fighting force and that's what diversity provides us. All right, so uh, just kind of as a quick context here, um, you know, opposition to diversity, as I said, it kind of started in the World War II era, understanding that it did happen a little bit before that, but you know, this is where you can start to read some of those congressional hearings and really recognize in the history of this, there's been opposition to diversity uh, from the very beginning. And I think one of the interesting things that I found is when I was reading in the late 1990s, so around 1999, all the way to around 2010, before women were integrated in subs, there was an eerie similarity between the conversations that were occurring that prevented women from serving in submarines, that also was the same conversation that was happening in the 1940s, preventing women from serving in the military in general. And I just found it telling to think that we have kind of repeated this mantra over and over again at each step of integration and diversity uh, when we make these differences in the military. Uh, this also happened again when we repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It happened when we integrated black sailors and soldiers into our military. And I found it, I think, interesting that at 2010, we were still seeing these same arguments. So in uh, Women in Sub specifically, um, I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on kind of the origins for the integration. So since 1999, sub retention has been around 30%. Uh, you can see on the chart on the left, uh, it's worse than all the other communities. SWOs aren't a ton better. Sorry, SWOs in the audience, but um, subs have definitely got you guys beat a little bit. And I think the interesting thing about the submarine community and their lack of retention is it is an incredibly difficult community to be a part of. The education, nuke school, and then the op tempo that submariners are going through is really intense. This is a big contributor to why retention is so low. But when the Navy looked at this, and especially in the late 90s and early 2000s, they were faced with a problem similar to 1940 when General George Marshall looked at the 8 million men that could serve in World War II and said, we have a manpower shortage. 
Um, just as a fun fact, it ended up being around 16 million men that needed to be serving in World War II. So that's a big part of the push for why integration first occurred. I think the submarine community looked at their problem and thought the same thing. Hey, we're excluding 50% of the eligible population, and we can't, we can't man our fleet. We can't support, uh, the per from a personnel perspective, getting these boats underway. Um, so this, these two graphs just kind of show you some numbers. Uh, it's really kind of stayed right around that 30%. The other interesting thing is just the attrition rate. I found that to be shockingly high. So 21% uh, of folks that go into the submarine community will attrite in the school or early process. Just as kind of a point of reference in flight school, I thought we were real hard asses down there and it's only about a 7% attrition rate. So that kind of gives you a good comparison. I think SEALs is probably like, I don't know, 80%. I don't actually have the numbers on that, but. Um, okay, so uh, women in subs, became a solution, right? If we get women into submarines, we can solve this manpower problem that we have. And just statistically, kind of when we look at women in submarines or in, in the workforce in general, you know, women constitute just under half the population, but they earn more high school and college diplomas than their male counterparts. Um, they earn a higher number of advanced degrees and women are more physically fit than they've ever been before. So I found this fascinating 45% of women, uh, sorry, of high school and college athletes are now women. So if you're a submarine commander and you're looking at the statistics, you immediately feel like we are missing out on a massive part of the talent pool that could have been integrated in the submarine community. So this quote from uh, at the time, this was uh, Admiral Donnelly, commander of the Naval Sub Force, who said, women earn about half of all science and engineering bachelor's degrees. They're capable women who have the interest, talent, and desire to succeed in the sub force. Maintaining the best submarine force in the world requires us to recruit from the largest talent pool possible. So what I'm trying to get at, out of this slide for you is that women were seen as a solution to a math problem. We didn't have enough men, so let's get some women involved. All right. See next slide here. Okay, so now that we've said we've got a potential solution to this math problem, let's evaluate how well did it go. Um, so this this part was a little bit harder for me to to gen up, and I think uh, part of that is because not all of this is going to be open source. And I worked really closely with the Women in Subs Task Force group, um, and there are both anecdotal and there are empirical results uh, that demonstrate women's performance in subs. So anecdotally, this is from interviews I've conducted as well as research I've read about other interviews conducted and from the inspector teams that have gone aboard different submarine units that have been able to give feedback because they have a wide variety of subs that they're going on. So they're uh, giving kind of that feedback. Um, the first one is that women or integrated subs seem to have uh, an increased diversity of thought. So that's kind of a we all understand that women add an element of diversity. You're going to have better problem solving, increased diversity of thought. They also seem to have more positive, healthy and professional atmospheres. I think this is one of the ones that I heard most frequently repeated actually by the male submariners. They talked about once those submarines became integrated, the level of professionalism on board uh, was greatly increased. There's better communication flow up and down the chain of command and within the crew. This was also one of the interesting factors that women benefited, uh, that the crews benefited from having women on board. They just provided a different perspective and an ability to communicate, especially with the chain of command about how the crew was doing. Uh, for my other female officers in the room, if you've ever had enlisted, I don't know if your experience has been the same as mine, but I found that having a door to my office became problematic because so many of my junior male sailors wanted to have closed door conversations with me. Uh, and I think it's, it's emblematic of the fact that women just often have better communication or sometimes more empathetic and provide a different ear that I think a lot of, especially male sailors in my case, um, were really interested in being able to take advantage of. And then lastly, uh, greater overall effectiveness of crew performance. This is a pretty hard one to put your finger on because there's so many variables for crew performance. But time and time again, I heard in the interviews uh, that I conducted that there was truly a difference in performance after integration occurred. So that's anecdotal. So I think it's hard to kind of really say definitively that that's uh, accurate. But I think the empirical results also back up this same data. So currently, female officer retention in the submarine community, most year groups exceeds, exceeds male retention, as well as does the promotion rate. Uh, having the integration plan that the sub community did 
may, mean that women in subs were double retained double that of their female nuclear surface warfare counterparts. I think that's pretty telling. Uh, so both both sets of officers are going through nuke school and submarine officers were retaining at double the rate. And then I think most specifically interesting for the submarine community was was this statistic. So this is your male and female enlisted retention. All of the squares that you see in yellow is where female enlisted retained at a higher percentage than their male counterparts. So if you're a submariner, uh, especially in leadership position, you're looking at these statistics and your head is exploding a little bit. Uh, we have a manning problem and women are not only helping solve that manning problem, but substantively they're performing at a very, uh, at a really high rate. So I'd like to kind of say, all right, so now that we've looked at you know, women were first integrated to solve the math problem. Now that they have been integrated, we're seeing a true impact in performance. You know, what does this teach us about this integration process in the submarine community? So I've kind of got four takeaways for you. The first one, again, like I said, is diversity really started as a solution to, um, to the manpower problem, um, both in the 1940s and in 2010. But women have continued to serve because they actually provide a substance solution. Women when they're given both opportunity and support are truly excelling in the communities that we're putting them in. I think we need to, with this information in mind, really think about how do we reimagine diversity and not just as something that is an ancillary benefit to opening the doors, but really targeting diversity as a national security imperative because we see the true benefits that come from having these diverse teams. So for me, it's not just about numbers, it's about substance. And if we can actually target women and diverse teams, I think we're setting ourselves better up better to handle the complex and challenging war, war spaces that we are going to find ourselves in the next couple of years. <clears throat> Before I kind of leave us on, on a good note, so all that to be said, where are we right now? I, Women in subs has gone well. I think the integration process has gone well. It's taught us that, that being thoughtful about how integration occurs means that we do have an opportunity to produce a higher caliber and a higher performing team. So this has really been good news, I think both for, for women in, in the military, but also the submarine force in general. But I, one thing that I like to caution us on a little bit is I'm not sure that our leadership has really gotten their mind uh, flipped in the way that I want them to. And by that, I mean really seeing diversity as a national security imperative in a way that means that they need to actively pursue it with an agenda and with deliberation. So one of the things that's happened with the submarine community, there are still some major shortcomings, and I found this to be really fascinating. So of the, there are 22 SSNs, so our fast attack subs. So for anyone who knows, those are going to be kind of the, the boats that are out on the front line if we go into a conflict, especially with China. 19 of those 22 are, are going to be awaiting major maintenance in fiscal year 26. So that puts us right around that 2027 time frame, which for those of you that are studying Indo-Pacific, you know, is a pretty critical time for military strategists and planners. So the Navy currently is not on track to include female submariners on most of the 29 battle-ready SSNs. What that means is only three of our 29 subs capable of being deployed in 2027 will be integrated. To me, this is really compelling because if we have definitively proved that having women integrated on a sub is improving submarine performance and enhancing the capability of that unit, why are we producing a result where only three of our 29 subs, even though we have up to 22, are not actually gonna be in the fight. So I am not trying to draw any conclusions exactly on whether or not um, this is intentional or accidental, but I think it does make me pause to ask leadership, are, are they truly buying into the value of integrated teams on submarines? And are they truly seeing diversity as a national security imperative? Because I think if they did, they would see it as a, as a combat capability. Having a diverse team produces a more lethal fighting force. And that would be something that I think they would pursue with more vigor, especially if we, we look at the numbers, three of 29. So just some, some concluding thoughts on this. Uh, you know, as I'm thinking about strategy and our strategic advantage, 
I keep coming back to the three to three main things. Our capabilities, our allies, and our people. Our capabilities is in our technology, our fleet, our forces, our exquisite ability to conduct warfare. Our second one is our allies, our treaties, our partners, um, the other nations that are going to come help us be be a part of our fight if we have to go into one. But then it's really, it's our people. And I think that we've heard a lot of statistics today about other nations, especially a nation like China, where less than 5% of their military are female. And diversity and diverse and capable teams, I think is our strong suit. I think that is actually a major strategic advantage that we hold and something that we need to continue to pursue. So in general, I think uh, a takeaway that we need to have is that we need the most capable fighting force to handle this increasingly complex battle space that we seem to find ourselves in. And I think as a result of that, and hopefully some of the data presented today shows that we need to see diversity, not again, just as an ancillary benefit, but as something that we need to target specifically as a national security imperative and looking at diversity as its own center of gravity. So thank you. Yeah. Certainly want to thank Ms. Compton and Lieutenant Commander Strand for their insights, their research, and their hard work to inform us so that we can be better thinkers and better strategize for the future.